The Square Ball Podcast. So, there's not much to report today, really. We lost in the cup, as we always do. Oh, and everything's on fire. Jorginho Rutter is off to Brighton. Our entire second string is inadequate, and I'm sorry to report that Max Verber is still here. Today, we'll try to decipher what on earth happened at Ellen Road last night, what on earth is going on in the boardroom, and if Leeds United are, in fact, cooked. That was cooked with a C. I'm Dean Smith. With me today is Michael Normanton and Chris McMenemy. Where do we start? The positive voices you've, you've looking for on a day like today. I know we've, <laughs> we've been chatting a bit in the office. We all think it's going to be fine, don't we? Of course we do. Yeah, that's why we're all wearing black today. We're in mourning. Got a black armband on the black T-shirt. You just can't maybe quite make it out on the, on the footage. RIP Leeds United. It was, no, it wasn't. It wasn't fun while it lasted. <laughs> do we start last night then? Uh, might as well. Um, yeah, that was terrible. Yeah, so I wasn't there, right? I was in a cabin in the woods with no signal and I woke, genuinely woke up this morning when I finally got to the outskirts of Skipton and saw the result and saw that Jorginho is off to, to Brighton and I've just been sad all morning since. So how was it last night? What what were the what were the vibes? Chris, how do you describe this? It, it, it's really hard to get too annoyed about the League Cup, but it was it, it was pretty shocking. Mm. There was elements of the sort not the yeah, the worst of Bielsa and the worst of Marsh and the the only difference is it was Middlesbrough, not Man City or, you know, Liverpool or Man United. It was it's yeah. You can look at it as oh, it's a really changed team. But then Middlesbrough were a really changed team as well. Um first half, I thought it was just about okay without being at all interesting or exciting. It was quite a boring game I thought first half I thought Rothwell was doing okay Verbal looked awful was my initial instinct of it just that he got turned within the first couple of minutes and just looked really really slow there was another one where he played everyone on side the ball went out for a they had to be crossed in and he was stood in the middle still playing everyone on side with his arm in the air shouting at the lines it's like you've played everyone on side <sighs> how about how about get in line or try and win this header oh you've missed that too um so I wasn't impressed with him at all, but I was worried by how little he seemed asked. I suppose would be the the general vibe I got from him. And this is maybe too harsh. I'm aware that this all comes with the baggage of him having fucked off last year and saying he was staying and getting us relegated and all that stuff. So I accept I've got a bias against him, but I thought he looked lazy in possession as well. Like he was just sort of, he felt like he was going, oh, someone else do it just passing it sideways knocking it to the nearest person just like i'm i'm just gonna stamp in a line there and open nothing after i don't have to do anything it was the impression i got from him so he stood out as being bad but then rode on next to him not a lot better i think f- f- most of the first half we were busy without creating anything of note it you could have sat there at half time and, and got the feeling that actually oh we're playing all right here we're doing there was nothing that you would go, there was no real chance that you could cling on to to go, oh, we should have scored there. Um, a lot of it was just very, very frantic once we got to the box, but without any a- actual action happening at any mm. point. I think that was the Jesse Marsh bit. That plus two wingers who aren't wingers playing on the wings. <laughs> don't, don't be talking about Jesse Marsh, you'll get yourself in trouble <laughs> again. So, um, yeah, that, that didn't really work. I mean, I thought Joffy... Started was on the right, for anyone who didn't see it. He was okay for bits, but then he's just not, he just doesn't look like a right winger. Yeah, be be careful what you wish for. I did say that I thought Joffy might start in the right wing, and I love the boy, but I think it's time to go and play football somewhere else and actually play every week rather than being drafted in for a League Cup game mm-hmm. where you've got three strikers, but only one of them's playing up front, and it's the one that's not really equipped to be playing as a striker right now. Yeah, I, I reached the same conclusion last night as well. I was thinking about it. it. just It's not working here. I don't know where he fits in this team. Maybe it's time to let him go. But then I looked and he's got three years left on his contract. And it was a Premier League contract. So granted, it will have dropped when we came down, presumably. And it, I, I assume no one's triggered his release clause, which is, I assume, in there as well. Um, but I dare say he's priced out of a move out on the back of having a Premier League contract. So we're in a position of either keeping him or sending him somewhere else and we pick up eight grand a week of his wages or whatever. Um, so he's he's stuck. 
Bamford in is in a similar situation, I suppose, in someone who is not really deserving of the contract he's got, probably, but it's the contract he has, and he has it for another two years. So he's another one we actually can't shift. So we, we've got the people who we can't keep and people who we can't shift, um, and we are left with that. <laughs> is what it feels like this morning. So eight changes to the starting lineup last night. Does any one of those players come out with any credit? Is there anyone that you're that you saw last night and you're thinking, right, they might be pushing for a start? Does it put any questions into Farker's head? We spoke on Tuesday about it, these kinds of games can ask all the right questions. Did it? I think Rothwell probably came through it okay. Um he looked slick in the first half an hour or so, but like everyone else, once the once the pressure started to tell and Middlesbrough came into the game, no one really looked great but I, I would say that there's enough in there to say well if Rothwell gets a, gets a run or you know not starts the weekend but gets maybe half an hour rather than 15-20 minutes there's more in there yeah I think Rothwell was fine but not outstanding yeah and I mean his performance in isolation is, was probably actually perfectly adequate but set in a context of a 3-0 defeat it's hard to be too pleased with it because the 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 thing as a whole just didn't function. So it's it's maybe unfair to to single him out as being a part of the problem because I think he was his bit of it was actually fine. I actually thought compared to Max Verber, for example, I thought Brendan Aronson looked pretty keen to do stuff as well, which is it's weird. That I feel like I'm now advocating for Brendan Aronson to be our new number ten, but I think that's probably where we are because I saw Piro try it again last night. I still don't like it. Um, and George is off, so I guess that leaves either Rothwell trying to play further forward or Aronson doing it. Yeah, I, I, I tried. To, I, I struggled to get too annoyed with Aronson. Um, I know some people were saying that he he was rubbish last night, but I suppose everyone was. The one I would say is I, I did see people saying if Darlow plays well tonight, should he start at the weekend? Uh, a big if, a huge if, a colossal if. I think. Um, haven't seen it back, but that first goal, it looked like he should have got down a bit quicker for mm. it. Um, not that I can talk, but <laughs> I'm also not getting paid Premier League wages to do it. So, Yeah, I mean, he was all right, I think, Dal. He, he dealt slightly awkwardly with the back pass as well at one point, where he just, I feel like Melia would have probably tried to control it, and he just belted it, which, I don't know, I suppose sometimes I'm okay with as goalkeepers doing it, rather than occasionally taking a risky touch where if it's not set up for you, you might just, I mean, I would just put it out for throwing every time because um, I'm not very good at football, but um, I suppose we've got used to seeing keepers try to, you know, regain control and stuff. So Dallow wasn't great on that, but I, I mean, I don't think Melee is getting dropped, is he? I do think it's a little bit disingenuous to blame eight changes because when you say eight changes, in your mind you're thinking, you know, two youth players, four players who haven't mm -hmm. played all season. It, it was mostly first team players. It mm -hmm. wasn't like, Back in the day when eight changes meant Stuart McKinstry was starting and, you know, Liam McCarran was at left back against Spurs. It's, it, they were all first team capable players or at least players who were being paid and expected to play first team football. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Pirro and Bamford as two experienced, would they would argue starters, were both just terrible, I thought. I don't think either of them had a sniff all night. I thought Bamford was just looked really slow. Piro, it's just not involved in the game. It's the same as we, if anyone didn't see it last night, it's basically the same as we saw over and over again last season when he plays at 10. It just doesn't seem to be involved in the game, apart from occasionally when it gets to him on the edge of the box, he, he comes alive a little bit, as he did for the putting the ball through for Aronson at the weekend. Like he can do stuff like that, but he doesn't pick the ball up deep at all. He doesn't really run with it. And contrast to when George is in the team and it, completely unbalances the opposition and the start, everyone starts dragging out a position it just seems quite easy to play against us Pira I just had a bit of a thought is the is the sale of Rudder and the lack of forthcoming winger options is that maybe our move to a back three and a sort of a 3-4-1-2 because that's what it looked like a little bit last night a little bit less width and more attacking power through the middle so you know Piro is less of a 10, more of a striker, mm. but not, you know, Stanton on the last man. Could be, I suppose, yeah. If, and I suppose if we've, if we decide that's now the best formation for the players we've got, um, but we're going to sign loads of players, right? But I was, yeah, I was going to say that's, in, that's incredibly depressing to think that 
we're selling a player because of a release clause, not because we actually want to. So then we have to then find a new formation to accommodate an 11 that Farker wants, as opposed to having the formation and the players that Farker wants. That's a very depressing thought. I mean, I'm not disagreeing with yeah. you. But well, it, that's why I'm very depressed this morning, Dean. Right. So, um, yes. yeah. so yeah, no, correct. Well, let's, let's have a think then. So if this was just in isolation, if it was just, I say just, but if it was just the 3-0 defeat, would we feel the same way as if an hour later that tweet drops from David Ornstein insinuating that Brighton and Hove Albion have activated 40 million release clause in contract of Legion United forward Jorginho Rutter. Would we still have been down in the dumps this morning or has this just set fire to our misery even further? I'm struggling to be to be too annoyed about losing a League Cup game out of context as you say mm-hmm. um, if we hadn't conceded three at the weekend you would just say oh that's the system failure it happens sometimes you get one day it just goes wrong and you get battered and that's it but it's now six goals in two games and obviously everything's on fire and <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to Darko Milanic coming in in the middle of September It did feel last night like a moment I think when because I suppose because all the goals came in such a short period of time, when you get a little spell of goals like that, there's a bit of you thinking, "Fucking hell, this could be like seven here." Because they just it felt like every time they attacked, they they were just threw on goal. It was a bit like when we played Swansea last year, and it felt like we were just doing the same thing over and over again and creating the same chance over and over again. And it was the same with this. They were they were knocking it with a quite a high line. They dragged us out of position. Someone cut in and shot, and it just felt, felt like it just kept happening. And it, it could have been worse than it was, I think. Oh, definitely. So I think there was definitely major concern in the stadium and to the point where probably more so than at any point I left thinking, I'm just not sure about this from Farker. I don't really know what um I don't really know what he's attempted to do here. And I don't know what and, and it was it's sort of funny in a way that we made five changes and they scored within about ten seconds, it felt like. Um, but that was a moment, I think, where the crowd were like, for fuck's sake. We also made five changes while Darlo was down being treated mm. for like five or six minutes. And I didn't realise, I was like, oh, there's a Middlesbrough player down and there's, like, there's no goalkeeper in goal. We've made five. Oh. But then I was thinking, who would you put in goal? I was like, the best thing would have just been to throw Bamford in goal and <laughs> get him out of the way for was the it, last half an hour. Was it a head injury that Darlo had? I couldn't really. I was in the northwest corner, if, so if I couldn't head, really tell what had happened. No, I wasn't sure either. I wasn't sure if it was a head injury. They might be like, "Ah, oh, well, we can use a." Do you still get a concussion sub? Maybe they'd be like, "Yeah." Maybe they'd be like, maybe. "Get get send the physio on with the blood capsules. Just open <laughs> open one of Oh, he's, he's oh, okay. His head. It's terrible. We need to we need to bring on an extra sub. Um, yeah, I think thinking about it, yeah, because Dallo came out, didn't it's someone who was through on goal, and they I think they they might have. Well, he might have fouled them, actually, to be perfectly honest, but they got the shot away, so um, it was fine. Um, but yeah, I I think there was there was concern in the stadium before anyone knew about Georgie. And then obviously, you, you know, you're kind of on your way to bed and you see it and you're like, right, nice one. Well, of yeah, so, so this is the big talking point today, really. Like Chris alluded to, league, losing in the League Cup, okay, fair enough. But then it's very Leeds United to be kicked when we are down. So we lose... And then an hour later, like I said, this tweet comes out, which has gathered such pace, just like George's horses, just galloping out of the traps there. It sounds like he's going, doesn't it, boys? How sad are we going to be to see him go? I mean, let's ju- again, let's just timestamp this. It's coming up to two o'clock uh, on Thursday afternoon. By the time this comes out, it, he may well have already gone. But he he has so much fun about him. He has so much to like about him as a, as a person and as a footballer, take away those assists from last season, that chance, crea- chance creation. It, it feels a lot like we are being asset stripped so far this transfer window. Can anybody make a counter argument to that? I, I've seen a lot of people saying that the reason for this is that we're planning to basically, or the, we, not, not me, I'm not involved, sorry. The the 49ers are planning to sell as many players as possible before dumping the club onto Red Bull to make it, to turn a quick profit. But that doesn't make any sense because the, the easiest way to turn a profit on what they've done would be to get the team promoted. So I think it's maybe not asset stripping, it's more, we 
the Archie Gray one, I still don't really understand. I'm assuming that was PSR and the, the deadline of the 30th of June. The last two deals seem to have been uh, release clauses that have been activated. So I would say there's not much that they could do. There's probably a lot they could have done in the 18 months between that clause being agreed and the summer coming up. But that's a different story. I, I, I don't really think it's asset stripping. I just think it's pretty poor management. Yeah, I would go along with that. I mean, the, the 49ers are in for a lot of money at this stage. They've, they have spent enough that they are, are unlikely to get this money back unless we're in the Premier League. Um, and I'm not, a, I'm not a big fan of the idea that someone is buying us to make money on us because where's the romance in it? But that's, that's what they're here for. And the idea is that it's mutually beneficial. They make money. That means we're good and we can all, we can all get on board with it. This summer has felt well, for to a point, he's felt all right. Like, I think people expected departures, but from Somerville going, I think it was always, oh, but we're going to get someone else. And, like, Rowe has been linked now for two weeks, something like that, a week. And he felt like if he comes in, Somerville goes, you can go, all right, all right, fine. I suppose it's one out, one in, one out. We're kind of replacing him. Archie, in some ways, is a massive loss for the future, but was playing right back for us last year. We got a right back. Again, you can look at it and go, well, there's a, there's a logic to it. But it's the it's the feeling of Leeds United of old of getting rid of someone for a big fee and bringing someone in on the cheap, like Kamara going and Rothwell coming in on loan. It just feels a bit like they maybe are just trying to just trying to pinch pennies in, in certain areas there, um, which when you've got the history we have, it's very easy to go, well, this is just like Bates again. This is just GFH again. This is selling Ross McCormack. This is Snodgrass out, Varney in. This is, you know, Varin in, in midfield once we've got no one else to do it. Um, so I think all those concerns are completely completely valid. And the the club can say, oh, well, we've, there's still time left in the window. But <laughs> I suppose there's a suspicion that, there's, that that's a fobbing off of people until the point at which the window shuts and then they go, well, we tried, never mind. And the big thing that's in my head as well is no doubt they will try and deflect slightly and say, these weren't our deals. These weren't our release clauses that are they're in these contracts, but they were in the building. And I don't know how much leeway they can get from being not directly, directly involved in those uh, transfers and those contracts going out. Because if you were still there, if you still had a stake in Leeds United, surely you had to say. They haven't inherited this situation overnight. They've known about this for a long, long, long time. And so Parag coming out after the playoff final and saying what he did, I just feel a little bit like we've been lied to and I don't like it. It's it's men and suits. They, 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 you know, it's money. They're, they're going to bullshit you. <laughs> they, they are, they are going to do it. And, I don't like it. But the thing is, you kind of just have to be able to see through it. And it's, it is hard to, I mean, you don't want to be cynical about every single thing that they say, because then you get branded as being miserable, but it's, it's not wrong. I don't think um, the, the fact that they're saying that they inherited these clauses, it, it is, it's, it's not, it's just not true. You're, mm. you're 44% shareholder at that point. Are you going to tell me that in, in any business, no matter what size, if you own 44% of a business, you don't have a major say and are a bridge of everything that happens. I just I just don't believe it. I'm sorry. And I mean, and the, the Rutter signing in particular, that was very much credited to the 49ers at the time, wasn't it? It was David Onstein, to go back to the um, his tweets. People have dug it out from the time and it was saying, um, minority shareholder 49ers Enterprise has played a decisive role in the club record signing. You've got Victor Alta there in his 49ers hoodie with sat next to Jorginho Ruta. They would... They were trying their best to own this at the time, so they can't wash their hands of it now and go, oh, these bloody clauses. Um, I mean, whether or not it's a a fair price, I suppose is almost a different matter, because I think it's not a bad fee for him, truthfully. For someone out of the championship who was, he's brilliant, but pretty patchy in certain areas of his game, like 18 months ago, if we'd have been told we could get 40 million for him, like having just signed him and seen him a little bit, people have been like, oh, yeah, get rid. You know, he doesn't seem to be necessarily up to it. So I can see the fee isn't bad, but for the club to have come out this morning, there seems to be this thing of, oh, they might be off, tried to offer him a new contract to get rid of this clause. You knew the clause was there. You knew there was interest in him. Where's this new contract been for the rest of the summer? Why, why is it not there for him the day after the playoff final to say, look, we, 
we want you again next year. We're going to have another go at it. And maybe you say to him at that point, you can have a clause, but it doesn't become active until next summer. So you at least tie a player down for a, for a year. You know, give him, give him an out, but not at this stage of the season. Because it feels like we're back to where we were at this point last year, where you had Sinistera, for example. I know his clause was potentially not triggered or was, depending on, on what you read. But he was there was legal action threatened from it anyway. So we kind of had to let him go. And the promise was that that's not going to happen again this year. And it has happened again this year. It it goes back to the the phrase, there's always a tweet. There's always something that you've said before, especially in these situations when everything can be trawled up through Twitter, YouTube, whatever. you got to be really careful about promises that you make. Um, and nearly no one ever is and then acts dumbfounded when people are pissed off. Mm. But this idea that it is men in suits, um, which I buy, you know, we've just had a talk with Tony Dorigo that will be out in your podcast feed and on YouTube tomorrow on Friday. Um, and he alluded to that as well. It's a business. But then if you think that we are supposed to have handed over the reins or Rad Rizani's handed over the reins to these incredible business people, they sign someone for 25 rising to 35 is what we kind of believe. But then they put a fucking release clause for 40 million in. Are we not supposed to have believed at the time that he was, we were signing potential so that we sign him and he grows with us and he becomes um, a, a player worth an awful lot more than what we paid for. This isn't an awful lot more than what we paid for. I suppose it's if, if we were in the Premier League, this release clause isn't active. And if we're in the Premier League, we're in a different world, aren't we? So it's, uh, I guess the impression that we've had from the release clause is that it was a bargaining chip of if we go down, your wages get cut massively, but you can escape for X amount of money. So I suppose there's a balancing out there, but... It feels like this is something they should have really, really seen coming and tried to head off a lot sooner than, you know, the evening a bid is made. Go, oh, do you want to stay, actually? We'll give you a new contract. It's like, well, it's a bit late now. And I'm sure that as a... It's not fair on Ruta either, necessarily, I don't think, to, to expect him to throw something in front of him at the last minute and go, oh, you can have this. Because he might just think, hmm, could have offered me that a few months ago if you were actually bothered it just feels like it feels like you now now you're bothered because i've got a better offer mm. i think it, it may come out in in time that the release clause it might have been slightly higher last summer so maybe it was 50 million mm. when we went down and then with non-promotion it might have gone down again the next year and um, uh, you know say it, it might have even been even lower if he stayed this year mm. and we didn't go up or it could potentially for both him and somerville i wouldn't be surprised if they're the clauses were in last year, but people took a look at them and thought, nah, not for that much. Because some of them last year, if again, at this point last season, you wouldn't have said was worth 25 million, would you? You'd have It would have been a stretch probably for someone to pay that. Whereas you look at both him and some of them Ruta this summer and you, I don't know, you've got a little bit more assurance, I suppose, from a, a successful season in the championship. I think as well, the you're saying that they should have seen this coming. Uh, Ornstein also said that there were two bids rejected. There was mm. 29 and 35. So it's not like this has just come out of the blue. They know that that clause is there. There's been two bids rejected already. There was also the talk last summer that Dortmund had made a bid. And I assume there's probably been other suitors in there because Brighton aren't the only team that will be interested in them, I would imagine. So 100% they should have seen it coming. And <laughs> but yeah. here we are. Yeah, burn it all to the ground, I think. Start again. Yeah, I mean, it's where where we go from here. He's he's going to leave, isn't he? Yeah, uh, he, so, he hasn't officially left as we record, but yeah, I would be a, astonished if he if he doesn't. So uh, we're assuming that there's no smoke without fire. So if this money comes in, when this money comes in, what do we do with it? And I, and I know that's not our job. <laughs> we become PSR champions. And we'll never sing that. I think you'd rather get a points deduction. I think we get, we're going to get points added on for how, being such many, good boys. How many points? 30 points added on. We could for fucking being, probably do with it at this point. <laughs> for being really well behaved and so, showing everyone else how to do it. So let's let's have a little scour around, see what we can turn up under some rocks here. So Jonathan Rowe, we, we linked with him for a good while. Um, he's training apparently with the under-21s in, in Norwich. Uh, they've not agreed a fee with us or Marseille. Do we want him? Do we need him? Do we love him? I think this might be slightly different to my prediction the other day that we'd win the league and then the Premier League. Um, but I think no matter what happens, there is still a team that will reach the playoffs there. Even if, if Rudder was sold and nobody else came in, 
I think it's there's enough there to make the playoffs, but you don't want to make the playoffs. You do you think though? The league. Do you think? I think a couple of injuries in bad areas and it, we're in trouble. We're a small squad. It's a rubbish league though. Mm-hmm. Like the amount of times last season where, you know, you'd see the team come to Elland Road and there was, I, I felt a certain level of ignorance towards the league last year. I remember being told like, uh, oh, West Brom are fifth. You're like, they, they tried to play the ball out from the back and just had to thump it long every time because they couldn't pass the ball six yards to each other and they're fifth in the league. So I still, I still think, you know, the playoffs are there, but I will flat out refuse to go to Wembley. Somebody else can have my ticket. <laughs> if we make it, I'm never doing it again. Um, so we better go up automatically, sign some players. Yeah, I know some of the, the more pessimistic stuff last night was, was saying, oh, well, it's, it's going to be like when we got to the playoff final under Blackwell and they got relegated the year after. It doesn't feel like that's on the cards to me, but I can see where people are coming from, that you go off a season, that you, there's an assumption that you'll build on it and actually, we're going to be going into this season with a far worse team than we had last year, which I know it felt like this at this stage we were at last season, we weren't quite sure where what was happening with the team. We were, I think we'd, we'd not quite signed Pirro yet. I think we're in the process of doing it. Rodon was coming in on loan. It was all still, like we weren't sure what was happening with Sinister and Adams was just going on out as well. So it was all very up in the air. And the idea of this summer was it will be more stable. We'll know what, we'll start the season knowing what the team is. We can build on it. We can add some players around the edge. Whereas actually, Somerville left relatively late because I think I'd assumed he, I assumed he would leave, but I assumed he would have left maybe a month before he did, like pretty much straight after the, the playoff final. Um, and then this is obviously happening with Ruta during the season. So we're, we're once again in the position of having to find a team. And essentially, in losing Ruta, we're losing arguably our key player, certainly a key player from the attacking sense. So you're in a point of having to rebuild your attack a week into the season, which is, it's not disastrous because, I mean, last year we got 90 points off the back of a similar start. But fucking hell, it wasn't meant to be like this again, was it? No, it's an uphill struggle and it's a struggle that we should always anticipate coming as Leeds fans, but for some reason we don't. We do we do stupid shows like we did a few weeks ago and we go, yeah, we're going to win the fucking league. And here we are now trying to to row back on that. Let's just touch on a few other players we've been linked with. So yeah, Jonathan Rowe. Um, I've seen some links with Stoke winner, winger Million Marnhoff, a £3 million linked in the YEP. Don't know anything about him. Should I, we have him? I quite like a player named Million. Mm. Yeah. But I'll only pay a million for him. No fair. That's fair. I think, I think that's fair. Um, Bashir Humphreys, Chelsea centre-back, 21 years old, last season at Swansea. Part, of, about part of that water site Swansea defence. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, I mean, Chelsea could probably do with the um, offloading a few, couldn't they? Yeah, we could probably take a full team out of uh, Chelsea's team. Swap deal? Wober? Uh-huh. Wober. Yeah. Mm. They'd, yeah. Pro- they'd probably take, we could probably, if they can PSR it enough, so we'll give you three million for, for him, but you can take Wober and pay it, pay it off over the next nine years or something. <laughs> they might they might go for it, you never know. Um, I feel like, after last night, I might want another centre back. I thought maybe we were okay until I saw it, and I was like, "Oh shit!" I did see someone in the West End with a Debio shirt, which I thought was a bold move. Oh, hipster! To get that, to get that put on, because he might probably won't play a minute this season. But fair play to him, I suppose. Another link is to Owen Beck at Liverpool. Liverpool left back um, was on loan at Dundee last season. Celtic apparently wants him, but don't want to pay the lofty three million pounds that Liverpool are asking for. And he's also the grand nephew of Ian Rush. Do we want him? He knows the club. Ish. Ish. It's he- the same link of Eddie Gray to Archie Gray. So maybe he's our new Archie. Mm. Although I did check Ian Rush's Wikipedia and he's one of ten. So he's got a lot of he's got a big family. So statistically someone was yeah, gonna play for Legion. Someone in the probably like one in every fifty people in the Liverpool area is, is related to Ian Rush. So <laughs> Doesn't mean anything. Get Ian Rush in and play the kids. Play, play <laughs> the great nephews. Ian Rush was meant to be a future Leeds manager when, when we got him. That was part of the promise of him coming was that he would um, be a coach and then potentially a manager and stuff. Instead, he was just a terrible, terrible right winger who could not run. Uh, but anyway. Hell of a moustache though. I left back. I mean, fine. I wouldn't mind back up there because um, Furpo is Furpo. He's... I suppose all we can say about him, we know we know he's all right going forward. Generally, fairly catastrophic defensively, but um, 
I feel like last season he showed enough that I'm I'm content with him being our left back for now. But yeah, if he's injured, um, we're into Sam Byram, who might also be needed to cover right back, and he can't do both at once. I do think we need a full back who can actually defend to add just a little bit of balance. You know, I don't mind Bogle bombing forward or Firpo bombing forward, but you saw last night, you know, one ball out wide and mm. there's a dyke steal. The the winger was just acres of space to run into. And he was awful at Ellen Road last season, Dyke Steele. Mm. He was terrible. And then he's just cutting through as like a hot knife through butter last night. Um so let's let's try and figure this out before we move on to the second part of the show. What do we need with this money? We need to keep Nonto, I would argue. We need to add at least one winger, a ten, a central midfielder, and a fullback. And a centre back. And a centre back. So five sign ins and keep everybody else. I'd say so. The squad, the squad is pretty thin anyway, and I think last night was a concern that you go, well, if that's how Bamford is going to look when he starts, that's not really good enough. If that's how Joffrey's going to look on the right, probably not good enough. Um, so, yeah, I pad out the squad enormously. Get some warm bodies in Angus, for God's sake, because it is, it is thin at the minute. Well, speaking of padding out, Chris Clarson has moved over to... Um, Where's he gone? Poland? Yeah. He's gone over to Poland and he's been sent to, to train with the reserves to work on his fitness. Um, and <laughs> all of the reports are saying that he's been spotted in McDonald's. Yeah, there's not about terminating his contract now. I, uh, I was in McDonald's at half 11 last night and you haven't sacked me yet, so... Well, you know, you've, you've turned up <laughs> in, in great shape. <laughs> <laughs> so I must admit, when they were showing the, the first little videos of them returning after summer... You know, doing the, the little jumps and the, the pulling and pushing on the bars and stuff. I did see Chris Clarkson and thought, bloody hell, you've had a good you've had a good summer. I know a lot of them go off and do kind of just play more football over summer, don't they? They go to sort of training camps in Spain and stuff where they work on football stuff. Um, not for Chris. Chris has done his own thing in summer and he's doing his own thing now by the looks of it. Um, but I suppose I suppose best of luck to him. It didn't do Neville Southall any harm. Or Paddy Kenny. Oh, Paddy Kenny. Paddy yeah. Kenny can never help biting on it, can he? When people tag him in that post on Twitter of him running in prison, he's photoshopped. <laughs> absolutely livid about it. It's like, yeah, but you, you didn't look much better for a lot of your career, Paddy. So um, maybe just accept it. The Square Ball Podcast. 